I'm gonna have to. All right, should be good. Should be good. Let's okay. Do it. All right. So for this strategy session, as I was mentioning earlier, I wanted to do something a bit different. Um, instead of just trying to saturate you with all this contextual information and and really kind of putting everything on overload, um, I'm going to kind of reel that back a bit. We're going to provide a little bit of context of the time period we're in and some key figures and dates and events. Um, but when we talk about uh, ancient Chinese history, specifically ancient Chinese military history, um, they have a very rich, as I know you, 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 you two are aware of, they have a very rich, rich literary tradition that developed over centuries, um, millennia as a matter of fact, um, that is an integral part of their culture. And it's um, something, it's, it's a bit of a phenomenon. Matt, Matt you might know this because you, you said you, you, you have some familiarity with the Chinese culture. Um, you know, after they had the great the great leap forward, and they the, the people suffered through the horrors of early communism under Mao, um, China today has made some moves more toward that are, are similar to more of like a, a Western democracy and economy. And a lot of the free thinkers in China are looking back in the past beyond the days of you know real uh, hard nosed communism. Um, and they're looking back to these these old writings to try to find inspiration and guidance. Uh, I don't know if you, I, yeah, I, I don't know if you are interacted with that, but um, the author of this book, um, the Seven Military Classics, <clears throat> is um, Dr. Ralph D. Sawyer, and he's a very very accomplished um, historian and strategist. Um, he's, I mean, just reading off the back of the book here. Um, leading scholar in Chinese warfare, he's worked in major intelligence and defense agencies. After studying at MIT and Harvard and a brief stint of university teaching, Sawyer has spent the past 30 years lecturing and doing international consulting work focused on China. Um, mm. He's worked for the Center for Military and Strategic Studies, and he's, he's offered several major works, and it goes on and on. So, I mean, uh, the guy has a, an incredible pe you know, pedigree, and, and his, his credentials are, are really impressive. Um, I, over the course of my studies, I just very briefly dip, dipped into this book and it's something I come back to on occasion because I, I would like to read it more in more detail and um, but we'll get into that near the end of this and, and have a chance to discuss some aspects of it um, and the particular reading but um, okay so to give us some context um, this is from Indiana University Bloomington um, and I'm, I'm borrowing it I found it online but it's a great timeline and we're talking about Bronze Age China here so when the conversation starts at Bronze Age China, we're talking the Shang Dynasty. Now, I, I don't know if you recall from our earlier uh, webinars, but we did talk about earlier periods in Chinese history, uh, the Shia Dynasty, but that was so far back in antiquity and with a lack of strong archeological or written evidence, there's a lot of conjecture about that being uh, an actual dynasty, so, so to speak. So when we when we really try to trace the roots of Chinese culture uh, and dynasties, so to speak, the most scholars begin with the Shang period. Um, obviously, there is a lot of scholarship and interest in previous periods, but th that's really for uh, specialization, uh, uh, highly trained specialists. And there are some military elements of that, but at that point, it was mostly tribal warfare and power struggles of of a very rudimentary nature. Um, the Shang period, however, is um, dates from uh, 1600 to about 1046 BC, and this period is based primarily upon archaeological evidence. Um, it's um, it was based around going back to the map here. So um, a lot of the early periods in China are based around the Yellow River region, uh, uh, Yellow River Valley region, south of Beijing. So when we were talking about the Shang Dynasty. Um, this, this culture came, uh, came, uh, rose to prominence and power around the yellow, around the yellow river Valley. And they did rule parts of geography that we would associate with Beijing today to, to a very limited extent. Um, but, um, that, that area around the yellow river Valley is really the, the, um, cultural and, um, political center of, uh, early China. And mm -hmm. obviously we can see a lot of, uh, a lot of developments occurring around this area. Um, some of the earliest indications that we have of 
Chinese history during this period are archaeological. And I'm just going to pull up this link for you so you can take a look at it. It's called the Yin Ruins. Uh, there's an ancient city there. And this is from uh, the actual uh, Chinese government and one of their um, one of their educational websites. But the Yin Ruins are very interesting. Um, they cut... Uh, I don't know if I can... Can I zoom in on this? I wish I could. Try and... I can think you that's hold control cool. and scroll the mouse, or I don't know if you yeah, might be able to view. Oh, there we go. Yep, fantastic. Good. Okay, so it is working. All right. Um, so this, these ruins, they they cover, as it states here in the article, they cover an area of thirty square kilometers. So it's a fairly large area, and it was once the capital of the Shang Dynasty. You know, we're looking at the empire about thirty three hundred years ago. Um, and they are, as I mentioned earlier, they've been basically dug the cradle of Chinese archaeology. There's a lot of um, excavations and unearthings that have been happening in this place for almost a century um, that have shown, that provided archaeologists and anthropologists with a tremendous amount of evidence concerning um, tombs, palaces, uh, evidence of royal court, early carvings, ceramics, things of that nature that give us some insight into the period. Uh, and if if you do some independent study on this at all, one of the things that they always talk about is this this paragraph right here. It says one of the most significant discoveries are the inscribed animal bones and tortoise shells known as the oracle bones, which carry the earliest known examples of Chinese characters. So that's where we see the earliest evidence of uh, Chinese writing uh, proto written languages on these animal bones called oracle bones. Um, and they're pretty prolific around the ruins. They say that they've unearthed more than 150,000 pieces. And it gives us a lot of insight into uh, their agricultural techniques, um, their religious and spiritual practices. Um, at this point, the defining characteristics of the Chinese culture were that the, the military used uh, bronze weapons and bronze tools, because we're obviously talking about the Bronze, bronze Age period. Um, chariots were a part of the military and they were probably imported somewhere around 1200 BC. Um, from the Central Asian steppe. Um, the military, yeah, and, and with the chariots, historians are, and archaeologists are, they're, they, they debate a bit in who, who specifically introduced the chariots, but they imagine it was one of the, the Asian steppe cultures, one of the raiding cultures, um, perhaps one of the same cultures that also came down and invaded to the West and introduced chariots to Mesopotamia and the Hittites and um, Sumer, and the Akkadian Empire and, and a lot of the cultures that we were discussing during the last webinar. Um, we also see evidence of animal husbandry, uh, human sacrifice, shamanism. Um, the leaders during this period were um, war chiefs and kings. They weren't necessarily emperors yet because the, the first emperor of China came much later than this particular period. But the men that rose to power during this period seized power either through direct force as, uh, on the battlefield or as posing as high priests. And again, we, we know this from some of the early writings that's, that's, as is depicted in this photograph here of this tortoise shell. Um, there, uh, oh, the bronze, uh, this is an interesting piece of uh, bronze work here. It says the ruins also bear witness to the prime of China's Bronze Age. The four-legged bronze cauldron, uh, Simu Wu Ding, discovered in 1939, measures 133 centimeters height and weighs 875 kilograms. So it's a pretty significant piece. It's the world's biggest bronzeware item ever excavated. So I find, I find that interesting. I, I found it worth mentioning here because usually, I mean, at least for me, when, when, I, when I think about the Bronze Age, I, tip, I equate that to what we were talking about last webinar. Weaponry. But, yeah, weaponry and uh, chariots, Mesopotamia, <clears throat> Egypt, uh, you know, to an extent, even, even ancient Greece. But the largest single piece ever on Earth actually comes from China. Um, and the, um, oh, and because of its outstanding universal value, the Yin Ruins um, was established as a world cultural heritage site. So um, I would love to go visit one day. I, I have, unfortunately, I have not had the opportunity, but it looks pretty fantastic with a lot of the pictures they provide here. So definitely worth, uh, definitely worth a trip if I ever get the chance. Um, with the timeline here, uh, there are three elements that we're looking at. And I'm going to zoom in on this again here. And you could probably um, just fix your fan just a little bit, I'd say. Yeah, sure. sure. It's so hot and you probably need the fan, but just a bit of a rumble. 
Thanks, man. A bit of a, a, bit of a sweet deal. So the timeline for the Shang Dynasty, and again, this, um, this timeline, it's divided into four uh, categories here, politics, society, culture, uh, are the three that we're really concerned with here at the beginning. Um, but the Shang period up here, 1500, the Shang Dynasty begins, and then 1200, about 300 years after its founding, and, and its founding was uh, simply a matter of, uh, again, this, an extension of earlier tribal warfare, where one, one person ascended to a, a position of authority and became the first king of the dynasty. But the most influential ruler during the Shang Dynasty was Wu Ding, uh, about circa 1200 BC. Um, and Wu Ding sent troops to uh, one, the, the largest largest set piece battle of this period uh, occurred uh, south in the southern region of the Yellow River Valley. And I don't know if it's going to let me. But in between the Yangtze and in between the Yellow River, this, this area here uh, going towards the coast, um, uh, Guifang, G-U-I-F-A-N-G, I'm not sure if I'm mispronouncing that one. But uh, troops were sent to this region, uh, and after three years of fighting, as he was trying to consolidate his control, uh, he managed to conquer it. So it was a very long, uh, continuous period of constant warfare and conflict in, in this particular city. And Over how long of, did you say? Three years of, of three siege, years. siege action and fighting. And when he sent them uh, to this area and they... Um, they conquered those lands. It it was a very impressive message sent out across the rest of, of China and especially those adjacent cultures. So the barbarian cultures that we see from the central steppes that the Great Wall of China obviously was built to impede. Um, once they got word of Wu Ding's success, they immediately sent emissaries and ambassadors to to the king's palace basically to negotiate because they were so intimidated by his grandeur and his ability to uh, conquer neighboring uh, civilizations and, and neighboring provinces that um, they basically realized that they wanted to coexist in peace rather than um, engage in any in consistent warfare with them. So um, just in his, his, his particular reign and his ability to conquer his neighbors, he sort of pacified uh, the greater region for a small period of time. Um, and his armies went on to conquer different areas around China, but it, it set a precedent and, and I'm speaking in very broad strokes here because well, Chinese history is just so dense and so varied, but what we essentially see in the early part of Chinese history is the rise of war chief kings, uh, and we see neighboring tribes battling one another, and then these war chief kings attempt to consolidate control. And they, at the same time, are fighting off these invaders from the steppes. And it's basically constant warfare. So Wu Ding is memorialized and memorized because in his, his, his influence was the brief period of uh, peace. But when we use the word peace, it, it's more or less in a relative term for the period. Um, things were a bit more uh, settled down after he consolidated control. But... Um, as is the case with anything oh, else. I'm sorry, did uh, Wu, Wu Ding, did he go with the assimilation as well? Was it attack and then you have to join us, fight for our army? How did he look to maintain control? Well, essentially, essentially he did because at, at this particular time in history, the, the military relied upon the aristocracy and, and the nobles. Um, and we see a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the wealthy people, a lot of the wealthy, educated, and privileged people, they are on the backs of chariots and to an extent cavalry. Um, but there was conscription needed for these large armies. They had large standing armies of infantry. And uh, when they would go invade a region and consolidate control, they were essentially, um, the victor was giving his, the defeated the option of joining the army or, or being executed. And a lot of times these people that were, were joining these invading armies their, their allegiances in the, these areas, they, they swayed like a pendulum uh, back and forth because it, it, sometimes, it, it, in a sense, with these people, the, the peasants and, and, the, and, the, and the poor conscripted soldiers uh, and, and 
the the farming culture, the agrarian societies, the the rulers that they lived under were sometimes more petty and cruel than the invading force. So another phenomenon you tend to see in Chinese history is when when these invaders do invade neighboring provinces, cultures, tribes, regions, what what have you, depending on the period, it's almost seen as a point of liberation in some cases. Mm. And mm. we see we'll see sometimes these large um, standing factions that have these really impressive cities with very strong, thick, high walls, and they have over a hundred thousand troops. But when their neighbor invades them, half of their half of their army uh, defects to the other side, mm. or, or, they, or they simply refuse to fight because they don't want to be part of a corrupt system anymore. Yeah, and I mean the big bad dynasty is coming to get you. You know, like yeah. why? What do you want to fight for? Just go. Oh, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's and that's what we see. Um, that's what we see all throughout uh, Chinese history, going into the Iron Age, going into the Spring and Autumn period, and going into um, going into the Warring States period, until much later, until we see our first emperor rise at, from out of the dust from the Warring States period, and he begins to consolidate control over all of China. And that's that's why we use the term, you know, emperor, the first emperor of China. But that doesn't happen until well into the Iron Age. Um, but um, yeah, nonetheless, that's that's one one of the constant ebbs and flows that we see during this period in uh, Chinese history. Um, so that's that's the Shang Dynasty, and the Shang Dynasty, uh, like a lot of empires that we've studied in the past, uh, suffered a lot of internal strife. Um, the the rulers became, as time went on, the the they they attempted to centralize control and authority. But they ruled with, iron, with with an iron fist, and they were petty. And the the people, uh, there was famine, um, you know, uh, widespread disease. And then when you combine that with exterior invasions and and rival tribes and rival fractions that are attempting to um, take control during times of, when there's power vacuums, that's when you see the transition in, in dynasties. So uh, the the Western Zhou Dynasty went from 1046 to 771, and it was the immediate successor of the Shang Dynasty. And um, what we see is uh, King Wu of the Zhou overthrows the Shang Dynasty at, at this battle right here, the, the Battle of Mu Yi. And uh, according to the history, the man that became king of this dynasty, King Wu, was a trusted commander in chief of the army of the, the, the last emperor of the Shang Dynasty. And initially, the emperor of the Shang dynasty uh, trusted Wu to guard his flanks to the west. And, and as we, another phenomenon we see in, in Chinese military history is a lot of these commanders, because they're dealing with such vast distances from their capital cities, and they have to cover such vast areas, and they have so many soldiers, is they tend to accumulate a lot of regional power. And then the, the, the kings sitting in their palaces become very paranoid that their mm. commanders are going to turn on them because it, it, it hap there's instances where it, it does happen where these, these army commanders, they feel they have a, a substantial amount of troops and they have loyalty and they feel that their king is petty and they, they march into the city or they attempt to turn on the king. Um, so in this particular case, uh, Wu Ding uh, became paranoid uh, and basically sent his general, uh, King Wu, uh, to prison and stripped him of his power for a brief period of time. Obviously, that made him very resentful. And when he was later released from prison, he went out, raised troops, and sure enough, decided to overthrow uh, uh, Wu Ding. And then we see the rise of what we call the, uh, the Zhou Dynasty. Um, the... It was a. Uh, it was basically a, as the arrows point here. The 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 red arrows are the invading force, and they they consolidated. Uh, King Wu consolidated his forces to the west, and invaded to the east, going down river, and um, established his empire. It's um. It was and it was one of those cases that I made reference to earlier, where he was invading uh, the the capital of the Shang Dynasty. He was invading Yin, or the, where the stars are right there, in the, more or less the center of the screen. And the king at the time had hundreds of thousands of troops, and this was a well-fortified city. Um, but he knew that when he, uh, on the eve of his invasion, that a lot of the troops that were under um, 
the, the, the king's control, he understood that they resented the government, the people were impoverished, and that a great, uh, about a third of the troops weren't even going to fight because they no longer want to be a part of a corrupt system. And on top of that, uh, I think another third, roughly a third, simply defected to his side. So he, once he invaded it, he very easily, you know, he consolidated all these troops and he had numbers on his side and uh, assumed control. Um, then what we see through this period, so I'm just gonna go back to this timeline so we don't miss anything really important, but during the Western Zhou period, we see here in 1045 where the Zhou, the, the, the Zhou conquest of the Shang uh, and then 1043 to 1040, the death of the Zhou founder, King Wu, leads to a civil war. And the civil war is between his siblings and his family. Um, once he passes away, uh, there is a regent put in place, but there's brothers squabbling with one another. And then the, the, the great disturbance that they cause in the, in the palace, in the, the central court of this, this uh, new dynasty, um, causes a power vacuum and we see external threats coming in. So we have all these chaotic forces all rolled into one. We have <clears throat> uh, brothers and family members vying for control of the, the, the empire, the dynasty. We have exterior forces trying to invade and it leads to uh, just a pretty massive civil war that lasts for, you know, a, a, the better part of a decade. Uh, and what eventually happens is the, the true heir, the, uh, which was a, a boy, and, and they call him the, the infant king, uh, is ushered off to safety downriver towards the east. And um, goes all the way east uh, out towards the coast. And that is where they later established the Eastern Zhou Empire. Mm. Um, but we're not going to necessarily talk too much about that today because the establishment of the Eastern Zhou Empire coincides with the spring and autumn period, which is a tremendously volatile period in Chinese history, but it also coincides with the introduction of iron and the Iron Age. So, so being that we're limiting our conversation today to Bronze Age China, um, this is something that we would, would hit on in itself a little later down the road. But um, nonetheless, it's just important to know that uh, the Western, the, the, the two the two dynasties we're talking about here, we see some similarities in that they both um, suffered a lot of internal strife, kind of imploded from the inside for different reasons. That coupled with external threats eventually led to their downfall. So we see these these constant ebbs and flows and these these migrations as we 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 look at you know the uh, the map here. And later on in Chinese history, we see even more migrations where the, the capital changes many, many times for each dynasty. Um, most of the time they're based around the various river valley regions, either the Yellow River or the Yangtze River, but they go as far south as n near, near Hong Kong and um, areas, areas uh, that are uh, further away from all the turmoil and strife that is occurring near the original capitals. Uh, and so the spring and autumn period, which is the, er the, the, the period that we're transitioning to, we're talking about, um, the period's name derives from the spring and autumn annals, uh, which is a chronicle of the state of Lu, which is the, uh, it, it's traditionally associated with the state of Lu is, it was one of the warring, warring states during this period. Um, the whole period is closely associated with Confucius, and I'm sure you're both very familiar with Confucius as, you know, a philosopher and a scholar. Um, and the, the, the one thing I will, will emphasize here before we go into the reading and we really talk about that is um, the, the, the Chinese focus overall during this period is that a um, meritocracy and a well-structured government and a highly centralized government is thought to be the savior of Chinese civilization and man. So a lot of the intellectuals and a lot of the scholars of the period are looking on around them and they're, and they're seeing all these conflicts that, that, I, that I just discussed, you know, brothers at each other's throats trying to control a dynasty, barbarians invading from the West, um, you know, people, uh, farmers being conscripted by in, in the thousands to go, go off and fight wars. So they, a lot of people see the system as corrupt they feel that they're living in tremendous chaos and they seek order. And that, that's, that's, what, that's what Confucius essentially taught. And that, that was his philosophy is 
people are based upon their their merit. Uh, you know, you should be humble. You should be uh, and, the, and the government. The government has a tremendous responsibility to the people to safeguard their welfare and provide them structure in, in their life. And rulers must be benevolent and they must care for their people in order to prevent all this despair and violence. And what that translates to in political and military terms, since the two are very much intertwined, is we see a lot of the writings to include, uh, during the later period to include the art of war, we see an emphasis on resolving matters, even military matters, uh, with violence only as a last resort. Although they frequently turn to violence and there was many conflicts, a lot of the a lot of the military leaders they strove to be something better than what they were. They 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 had very admirable virtues, and a lot of the writings are consumed with virtues how we how we should be, what we should strive to be instead of what we actually are. So. In a lot of the writings, you see these, these ideals about facing opponents on desirable ground, a lot to do with timing, and, and, the, and the bottom line in a lot of the writings is to not, not even fight your opponent, defeat your opponent without raising the sword, if, if at all possible. Mm-hmm. In, in, in reality, however, you know, that, that was rarely the case, which you have, you know, what, more often than not, what you see is a lot of these major armies clashing with one another in, in, in century after century of bloodshed. So that that right there wraps up my context of the period. Did you have do you have any questions in particular about the culture, politics, religion, or anything before we get into the reading? I'm pretty good. I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I think I think the things that I've got will be in the reading. Okay. So um, the reading there. Well, okay. Let me back up here. So the the seven military classics. Okay, uh, the seven military class- classics are, are the, uh, they're basically a compilation of um, the most widely recognized scholarly works defining ancient Chinese history. And mm-hmm. the seven military classics include um, the one that we're going to talk about today, which is Tai Kung's Six Secret, Six Secret Teachings, um, the methods of... Uh, the Methods of Suma, Sun Tzu's Art of War, uh, Wu Zhu, and uh, Wai Lao Zhu. Uh, three, the Three Strategies of Hung Shi Kung. And um, there's uh, some correspondence between some of the later warring generals that are included in, in the seven works. Now, before we start really dissecting and talking about the first one, what's important to note is with the majority of these works, the, the authorship is a bit ambiguous. And uh, I say that because a lot of times the person that is credited with writing them, such as Sun Tzu, there's a lot of academic conjecture and a lot of debate over the nature and course of his life. Was he actually one person that sat down and and wrote the entire work himself? Or is it more of an amalgamation of centuries of teachings that that he just kind of compiled or that multiple authors compiled and eventually one person put them out? Um, And you see that. That's a trend that goes uh, across uh, many works. With with most of the works and the ones we're not going to talk about today, a lot of their a lot of their teachings and roots can be traced to the early spring and autumn period, which is the Iron Age. So that's why we're not going to discuss them. But in the one we are discussing, Tai Kung's Six Secret Teachings, um, that is traced to the 11th century BC, and it's basically a work that discusses uh, civil and military strategy. Uh, and it's uh, traditionally attributed to uh, Lu Shang, which was a top general of the Zhou dynasty during the period. And um, he was also the founder of the Zhou dynasty. So when we talk about um, the Zhou taking over, um, Lu Shang, he was the one that assumed the name King Wu once he defeated the Shang dynasty. So um, he's attributed with this work. Um, although it's not necessarily written from a first-person perspective, he doesn't identify himself as that. Um, it's actually written from the perspective of a statesman attempting to overthrow the Shang Dynasty. So he kind of writes it. He writes it in the first person, but he writes it from almost a, a semi-fictitious perspective. So he's not he's not injecting himself in the work, but instead he's kind of chronicling what had happened, a lot of the, a lot of the what ifs, and and how to how to successively consolidate. And exert political and military influence on on your enemies. 
Um, Can I just clarify then? So it's yeah. the, the guy that wrote this is the first king of the Wu dynasty. And he's the one who led the conquering of the Shang dynasty. He was a, uh, he was a top general. Of, a top general. Of King Wen of the Zhou. Oh, okay. And he was one of the one of the first king's top generals. Okay. And he's he's generally credited with the the founding uh, uh -huh. of, of, of his his um, his military and political philosophy is kind of what laid the foundation for the dynasty. Oh, okay. it's, it's, it's what, oh, what okay. defined him more or less. Okay. Oh, so he didn't just plan how to take over the Shang dynasty. He even implemented how to how to implement a new system. Exactly. Yeah, and because well, because when when he when he when he took over, when when they defeated the Shang Dynasty, you know they, they looked at it and they said, well, <clears throat> you know, uh, one of the one of the most pivotal and momentous turning points in in the conflict, the battle, was the fact that the Shang's standing army, half of the army didn't even fight, or or, or, or otherwise defected to their side. So you obviously, when you look at that, if you're if you're an invader and you successfully defeat them, you, you think to yourself, well, what the heck am I going to do to prevent that from happening to me? So yep. in addition to covering military strategy in this book, he also covers civic responsibility, uh, how, mm. to, how, how to administer political policies and, and things of that nature. Oh, yeah, okay. Interesting. Um, so the six secret teachings. What are the six secret teachings? Uh, I, I'm going to put my outline here because I, I think I did send you all this URL earlier. Now let me click on my hyperlink here, pull it up. This is, uh, yeah, so from changingminds.org. Um, and it just basically encapsulates what we're talking about here. In the Shou Dynasty of the 11th century BC, um, an elderly eccentric advisor known as Tai Kung set up principles of government warfare through... Could you, repeat could you that if you wouldn't mind? Mm -hmm. uh, through re reported conversations with King Wen. So the perspective that this is written from, again, is this is a, a, a successful general and statesman writing this, but he's recounting it as these conversations between uh, a, a political and military advisor and the king. So it's, mm. it's a, I would say we could probably call it, if we had to classify it in the Western sense, maybe a work of historical nonfiction because it's not entirely false. I'm sure there were many conversations of this nature and there were valuable exchanges, but the, the premise under which some of the conversations occurred and the exact details are probably embellished quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, I think the important part is what the teachings are, the substance and the point of them. And I, I basically distilled these six secret teachings. I, I, I did a little research and I just distilled them each down to a paragraph. So we can look at them very quickly, okay. and we can just we, we can discuss we can discuss them in great we can discuss them in greater detail if you like. Um, Excuse me. I mean, this guy seems something of a, a visionary in the you know in the period. Yeah, in in, in you know, it's I, I would I would have to agree. I mean, it's I think it's a testament to his um, to his foresight and his ability as a as a ruler and, and a statesman that. You know, this was written, what, 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, and we're, we're still discussing it today. So it obviously holds weight in some way, shape or form. Um, but so the six secret teachings, uh, the first one is a civil strategy. And these quotes here, I put a foot, footnote on the first one. They are from Dr. Um, Dr. Sawyer, who compiled and translated this entire book. Um, I didn't, I didn't reference every single one but anything that appears in quotes that i'm, I'm going to read directly comes from this book so that that's where the credit is due <clears throat> um but it says here the civil strategy moral effective government is the basis for survival in the foundation for warfare the state must thrive economically while limiting expenditures foster appropriate values and behavior among the populace implement rewards and punishments employ the worthy and refrain from disturbing and harming the people uh, the strategy teaches commanders never to delight in small advantages where that is all they will achieve. And then I highlighted what I felt was a key part here. It teaches that the greatest gains result from benevolence and helping others achieve their aspirations for a better world. 
So what he's advertising here is that the government has a very significant civic responsibility to the people and they should the government should take care of the people and provide for the people it should also punish those who break laws make sure that the people have jobs and employ spend the people's money wisely but at the same time not be so over intrusive or so invasive as to upset the natural balance of things and to uh ruin the quality of life for everyday people hmm. <laughs> And reading this, I, I started to think of it. I, you know, I was like, "Well, that's that. That sounds great." Um, and I, you know, I, I tend to reflect on the present when I read things like that. And I, I think um, a lot with what's going on in the United States, but even more so around the world, especially with a lot of the the, the larger uh, extra uh, international uh, agencies that we see. You know, like the European Union being an example. Um, you know, are they following this maxim? Do, 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 do our governments in the Western world uh, employ, this, employ this strategy? <clears throat> and at, at points where I, where I see that they're not employing this strategy, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's where we see a lot of consternation, a lot of debate, and a, and a lot of heartache. So I think it's still very applicable today as much as it was back then. And, and our, our political leaders would do well to <laughs> maybe get in this book and read it a bit and try to adhere to it. Sure. Uh, I think that's interesting, like that last bit, helping others achieve their aspirations for a better world. I've never heard anyone say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You always and, think like I should achieve my aspirations for a better world, but <laughs> it says it right here. Yeah. And, and a lot of these passages have been interpreted by different people in so many different ways, depending on their own worldview. And that, that that's, a, that's a critical element to understanding history and, and really deciphering a lot of this stuff is you first have to understand your own worldview to really grasp what 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 is said in these things because if i'm a stouch if i'm a stouch uh capitalist and i'm i'm a i'm a blue-blooded you know republican and or or libertarian and i i just i i I love the i cherish democracy i look at that highlighted word and i i think you know it teaches the greatest gains result from benevolence and helping others achieve their aspirations so that to me is the government providing people with opportunity. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily saying that you have a, a particular right to anything, but mm-hmm. you at least have the opportunity, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. On the flip side, if I go 180 degrees out and I look at it from the opposite side of the spectrum, if I'm a stout, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm a hardline socialist or even to a greater extent a communist, and I'm looking at this, well, I, a benevolent government, yes, because you, you could argue the fact uh, if someone that, believes in communism uh, and is very much behind the centralized authority and the communal values of communism, they can see benevolence in that. And then helping others achieve their aspirations for a better world. But what what is a better world? Is the world, the better world around us, your individual world, my individual world, or the world in general, or are we talking about a better state? Are we doing it for the collective? Mm. You know? So it it's a very interesting talking point that yeah. you, you can debate at length. It really, the, the important part is to understand your own worldview, how you interpret it. You know? Yeah, yeah, because there's all these words like in it, you're like, mm-hmm. okay, gains. Like what are gains from what perspective? Like mm-hmm. helping others, helping whom? And in what way do you help them mm-hmm. um, achieve their aspirations? Like which aspirations and what is a better world? <laughs> That's mm-hmm. all open for interpretation there, isn't it? You know, and, you know, it, it leads us to think, too, during this period, and I, I would have to study much more in the period to understand the, the perspective of the author. But, you know, when they're talking about helping others, are they talking about helping? Are they really talking about helping everyone? Are they talking about helping the farmer that's over there shoveling, shoveling up, you know, fertilizer and, <clears throat> and hauling, you know, rice around? Or are we talking about the nobility and the aristocracy, the people of wealth and influence? Yeah. So it's a lot, a lot of interesting things to, to think about. I, I, for one, think that they're probably to an extent talking about the common people because peasant uprisings were pretty horrific in, in this particular period because there were so many people. And, you know, if you have hundreds of thousands of people all revolting at the same time, that's going to cause significant disruption, damage and harm to your, your, your economy. Mm. Right, right. So in that way you're saying 
like when it says help others, you interpret that as like, well, others meaning a collective in a way, achieving just their, the, just the, the nation's aspiration for a better world in a way. Is yeah. that your suggestion? Yeah, and I, I think, well, I think in this context, the way they wrote it is there was, they were definitely placing an emphasis on the point that the, the people, the common the people, people, common people <clears throat> almost yeah. need to be, almost need to be taken care of as a, a kind of children. They need right, to be, right. they need to be tend after and they needed to be placated because when a four-year-old is not placated, they have a tantrum and they, they thrash around on the floor. When, when 200,000 starving peasants are not taken care of, then they, they burn down your palace and they try to kill the king. So that, that's right, what I got. Right. Yeah. So if you want to come in, come in as a leader and you're not, you know, the people don't see you as benevolent in the sense that you're helping them achieve their aspirations for a better world. Well, then you're going to have a situation where you have a third of your army not fight for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Uh, and then we see, uh, so the next one here is the military strategy. And it continues, it kind of, it, it, it um, <clears throat> continues off the coattails of the previous discussion talking about civil affairs because military strategy, civil affairs, and politi politics are all very much interrelated. And the, the ancient Chinese realized this at a very early stage in their development. Um, and it analyzes the current state of the Zhou Empire um, and the prospects of overthrowing the Shang. So this is, this is where the book is written from a period where it was written at a point where the overthrow was already accomplished but the author was looking back into the past about the prospects of it. Why did we do it? You know, what, 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 what would be the benefits of doing so? And, and the quote from the reading says, attracting the disaffected weakens the enemy and strengthens the state, employing subterfuge and psychological techniques allow manipulation of the enemy and hastens its demise. The ruler must visibly cultivate his virtue and embrace government policies that will allow the state to compete for the minds and hearts of the people. The state will thus gain victory without engaging in battle. And the, the one thing that stands out to me there is uh, we hear a phrase that's pretty common uh, throughout the 20th century, especially when we're looking at uh, battling communism, is uh, this right here. The minds and hearts. Winning the hearts and minds of the people. So from a military perspective, even at this early period, the rulers realized that they needed to gain the hearts and mind of the general population. And the overall takeaway is that the strategy teaches commanders to achieve victory via benevolence and wit, preferably without fighting. And, and it put in another sense, do we really need to march our army down the main thoroughfare of the city and needlessly slaughter people? Or, or can we entice them to our side? All right. Yeah. Which is, which, or, you know. Yeah. Which is exactly what they did, and that's how they defeated the Shang Dynasty and, and came to power themselves. Um, okay. So it's teaching the commanders to, and this is a very common theme. It teaches military commanders and, and political and policymakers to outwit opponents through dipl diplomacy and manipulation instead of brute force. Okay, I might just um, I might just read this out loud to myself again, just so I can drill it in. Okay, attracting the disaffected mm -hmm. weakens. Who, who are the disaffected? So the disaffected in this case that they're talking about would have been the uh, members of the Shang military or the, the Shang peasantry that were starving under famine conditions. Right, that right. Realized, realized their government, they would, they would look at their king who lived in this opulent central palace and had this magnificent court. Well, uh -huh. their, chil their children were basically dying in their beds because they didn't have enough to eat. Gotcha, that's your, gotcha. That's your disaffected. Okay, so if you track the disaffected, that weakens your enemy mm -hmm. and it strengthens the state. Employing subterfuge and psychological techniques. Can you tell me what, what is subterfuge? I've heard this word but never understood it. Oh, well, subterfuge is uh, the um, covert or clandestine use of um, political and social tactics to manipulate, um, manipulate the, the opinions of people. So spycraft, essentially. You know, oh, okay. uh, plant, planting a poison pill in society, or, or, or uh, spreading propaganda. Right. Okay. <laughs> Employing subterfuge and psychological techniques allows the allows manipulation of the enemy and hastens its demise. Sure, the ruler must visibly cultivate his virtue and embrace government policies 
that will allow the state to compete for the minds and hearts of the people. The state will thus gain victory without engaging in battle. So, right, okay. Yeah. And again, something that's that's very applicable to today. And, yes. Um, it's 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 an area of study that I I, I personally want to get into. Um, it's something that I'm going to be picking up next month when I resume my graduate studies in international security studies. But we can see in the the Chinese culture, at least at least I see it, my perception from an outsider looking in, a Westerner, when you study the history, <clears throat> you see a very patient, persistent. Uh, uh. And I still, I still think that a lot of what is written here guides their statecraft today. And um, it's, it's. I, I just think it's incredibly impressive that they have such a, um, such a, a rich and lengthy history that um, is still, you know, some of the, the the prescriptions for a a more effective government and military are still being followed to an extent today. Yeah. Um, we should probably stop there because I have a call on the hour. Okay. And let's pick this off and pick this up again. This was uh, super interesting. Um, do you want to say any closing words to, before I end the stream? Uh, well, no, we just said uh, we discussed two of the secret teachings and we have four left. So we can cover those in the next session. And then um, I think we can probably just uh, close out with a little more context of the period. And then we'll we'll discuss where we'll move on from there. We can either yeah. remain in China or we can we can go back to the Mediterranean and discuss the transition into the Iron Age. There's yeah, yeah whatever, whatever allows us to like, whatever facilitates us to discuss stuff like this because this is the kind of stuff that makes me go. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I thought you all would enjoy this a bit more because I the, the, the first Great. series of webinars was mostly for foundation and context, and now I think we can really get into the yeah. Well, this is great. And philosophy and stuff like that. Very very cool. Okay, okay, I'm gonna end the stream. Perfect.